Um, okay, so as Matt, Matt said, we're trying to give you a potted history of, uh, of not the site at this, this point, but the history of our, not just our, lots of, uh, lots of people's lobbying, project work and outcomes that, uh, that we've managed to achieve for the site. And it's not, it's not in necessarily intended to be a sort of like what we did last summer type thing, but hopefully it can inform you how this might be replicated elsewhere. And, and to say as well, this isn't just about outcomes for archaeology, it's outcomes for local communities, it's outcomes for natural history and ecology as well. And, and that's what we, uh, we, we tried to do. We tried to bring all of those interests together so that we, uh, we established a, a solid network of individuals and organisations and uh, so we could increase our, our power and influence when it came to applying for bits and money and things. So my involvement um, in the site uh, started about 2007. I was living about 10 minutes walk away. I had an allotment about 10 minutes walk away. Um, Matt introduced me to the site and, uh, and asked me if I'd like to come up to talk to some travellers who, uh, who were camping on the site at the time. And we, uh, we, uh, we spoke to some travellers up there and asked them not to, uh, to dig pits um, on the monument and told them that there was burials there and things like that. But that was, that was part of a series of, of detrimental things that were, were happening to, to the monument itself. There was no protection. You could drive vehicles straight on there and that regularly happened, not just uh, oh, scrambled bikes but caravans and, um, and, and other vehicles. Um, there was... Uh, so we, we came to the site and we, we, we thought we'd make a concerted effort to try and appeal for the, uh, the site to be better secured um, and, 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 and we started thinking about how we might go about that. So we wanted to have a, a, a dual approach really. Firstly we wanted to lobby for the, uh, to have the site secured but we also wanted to inform the public as to, as, as to the value of the monument. I mean this is one of the earliest monuments that we have in the country. It's one of the best examples of Neolithic causeway enclosures. It was one of five uh, causeway enclosures that, uh, that first sort of became the type sites along with Windmill Hill and others um, for, for this monument type. So, uh, the first thing that we did, as Dom uh, explained, we're part of University College London and, and there's various like little pockets of money that you can apply to and, and things within there. Um, we thought that the, uh, the, the first thing to do was to have a sort of like a state of the union as to what's happening on site. So we went to uh, DOM and CAA and we applied for a small amount of money in order for one of our surveyors to come on site and do a topographic survey and a condition survey of that monument. We obviously uh, requested permission from Historic England and from Brighton and Hove City Council to do that because the site is owned by Brighton and Hove City Council. Um, and with about a third of it, three quarter, two, uh, half of it being leased off Brighton Hove City Council by the race course. So we asked permission to do this, we conducted a condition survey and then we could take this condition survey to, the, uh, to Historic England and to Brighton Hove City Council and, and say well look this is, these are the areas of damage, these are the areas of modern tipping and things like that, we want to try and do something about that. Um, at the same time, we, uh, there's a, a fund at UCL called the Beacon Bursary um, and it uh, provides small amounts of money in order to do uh, outreach events. We applied to the Beacon Bursary, we got 1,500 quid uh, from them um, and that facilitated us getting the uh, well, hiring uh, marquees and things like that to host a prehistoric archaeology day on the site. Um, and, and it's important to say that this was not just us. Um, this was also Brighton Hove City Council and the Rangers Service, Brighton, uh, Brighton Hove Archaeological Society, and lots of other individuals and volunteers who, who came together to, to make this uh, event a success. Um, we printed off leaflets, we went around all the local houses and we knocked on all the doors, explained to them um, that they had a fantastic monument on their doorstep. Many, many people didn't know even those living in Monument View, that they were on the doorstep of a, of a scheduled ancient monument and, a, and an important site. Um, we ended up getting 700 people uh, on the hill that day in a 10-hour in day. Um, we got press along as well, uh, and we also got a Brighton councillor along, I believe, that, uh, that Matt spoke to. 
Um, and, and that's when the, and we got nice things said in the paper and, and, and things like that. And, and we reported this back, I believe Paul Roberts from uh, English Heritage came along to the site, who's the, he's the sites and uh, uh, he's the warden for the site. Um, and that's when the lobbying sort of like stepped up. So we were speaking to both English Heritage and Brighton House City Council. Um, and there was a debate going on in the background, and there had been for quite a, uh, quite a few years. First started with the Archaeology Working Group and Brighton and Hove Archaeological Society about getting bollards on the site to, to secure it. We, were, we went back to uh, Brighton Hove City Council about this. Um, the conversation improved, discussion between English Heritage and Brighton Hove City Council improved. Brighton Hove City Council agreed to pay for the rest of the uh, uh, condition survey because we got funding to do about two thirds of it. Brighton Hove City Council paid for that last third and paid for that report to be done. That showed goodwill to English Heritage. English Heritage uh, freed up some funding to help Brighton Hove City Council and then together they paid for the installation of 50 or so steel bollards along that road. So it, steel bollards along the road, um, to replace uh, a series of timber bollards that had rotted or been chainsawed off so that people could gain access to the site. So that was a, that was a major win, you know, we'd managed to secure the site and, and prevent lots of vehicular access, uh, vehicular, uh, access uh, damaging, um, damaging the monument. Um, So, and that was, what, 10, 15 years at least after Brighton Hove Archaeological Society first started trying to lobby Brighton Hove City Council to do this. Um, and all of this, uh, I, I hope you're, you're gathering, is that it's, it's taken a long time to sort of like get this funding uh, to, to do these fantastic things on site and secure the site. Certainly in this last phase, probably 20, 30 years or something. Um, so after that success, we started thinking about what we could do next. Um, and we went out looking for, uh, for money to not only to improve the, the site, the site conditions, to investigate the monument, but also to improve the archive from the 1920s and 30s excavations, which was being held by Brighton Museum. Um, it was still in all the original uh, packaging and cigar boxes and all the rest of it being uh, stored in the cellars underneath uh, Brighton Pavilion. Um, it desperately needed repackaging and reordering and, uh, and, and sorting out. Um, so, uh, we, uh, the project, as Dom's mentioned before, the project was uh, joined by Dr. Hilary Orange, uh, who had a background in, um, in uh, outreach and, uh, and, and things of that nature, and by Sarah Wolferston, who had a background with uh, applying for HLF funding and, and, and things of those order. So we, and we started speaking uh, more fully to Brighton Museum. Brighton Museum uh, hosted a, well, Hillary started uh, contacting lots of different voluntary groups uh, across Brighton. And the majority of these are not heritage groups, they're uh, groups, uh, local community groups, uh, uh, natural history groups, uh, just, just everybody who was uh, interested in improving the situation in this part of Brighton or in, in archaeology. Um, this resulted in the end of two days worth of ideas workshops um, held at, at Brighton Museum. Um, we ended up with about 50 attendees from various groups um, and then Hillary continued that uh, discussion afterwards and in the end we got 20 uh, voluntary groups uh, committing to support the project. Hillary uh, wrote this all up in a report, and, it's, it, and it, it comes back to how often these reports have been so useful, and there's a few more that you'll see as we, as we come on. They sort of like, a, it's great holding these events and getting people's opinion, but if you don't set it out in a report that you can then wave at people again and again, then you're, you're missing a trick, sort of thing. So Henry produced this report, and it showed the support that the project had, showed the so the depth of, uh, depth of support and also sort of like gave us indications as to where we might take the project. Mm -hmm. We got very excited at this point because we're getting, we're on a roll, we were getting very excited and we started looking to the Heritage Lottery Fund as to what bid we might create. Um, we started going for a landscape, 
Landscape Partnership bid. We hadn't actually applied for HLF funding before, and uh, we decided to go straight for a couple of million <coughs> and, uh, and replicate what we were doing at Whitehawk Hill across Brighton <coughs> and, um, and things of this order. In the end, that was a step too far. Um, certainly because the Landscape Partnership bid really has to be led by Brighton and Hope City Council as the landowner and the and the main body. Brighton Hope City Council already engaged in a major HLF bid up at Stanwood Park. We were driving this, and it just, it, you know, it, it wasn't, wasn't the time. Um, so we stepped back from that landscape partnership bid and started looking more towards a, our heritage bid, which is uh, uh, up to 100 grand um, and, uh, and would encompass all the things that we wanted to do at, at this site. <clears throat> we sort of, we still had the support from all of those voluntary groups, but we tightened up the white walk partnership. So it was us, Brighton Hove Archaeological Society and Brighton Hove City Council. That was the, that was the, and Brighton Hove City Council being the Brighton Hove Museum Service and City Parks and, um, and the Rangers Service. That is a complicated uh, thing in itself, especially when you haven't done it before, because you have to have agreement as to the objectives that you're going to achieve, agreement as to how the finance is going to be uh, arranged, who's going to provide match funding, who gets what money, what activities people run and actually do. And it actually ended up in us having to draw up a legal contract between ourselves to prove to the HLF that we were a solid enough partnership that would warrant that funding. So, you know, it was a steep learning curve through all of this. And there's our, our heritage bid, which was written again by Sarah and Hillary. Um, and it's invaluable having people with the knowledge of these things because you start looking at the language that you have to put down in order to tick the boxes in these, uh, and you could have a fantastic project, but if you can't express that properly in an application, then you're not, you're not going to get anywhere again. Um, but we were successful, um, and um, the bid was well received, and we got the, the maximum amount, and we were warned that if we did go for the maximum amount, then it was unlikely that we would get it, because, uh, you know, only I mean, what they view as sort of exceptional projects will achieve that level. But we, I think we got about a thousand, fifteen hundred pounds less than their, their maximum amount for, for the bid. So that was a fantastic success. So the project that we created in the end had several strands to it. We wanted to improve the site still further. We wanted to engage uh, the community properly um, in that site. Um, we wanted to improve the uh, condition of the archive being held by the museum. We wanted to reassess that archive and get that information out into the archaeological community. But we also wanted to make sure that the volunteers were engaged in all of this process um, and we still managed to get over some quite complex ideas because at the, we don't want to dumb down the monument. The monument is complex, it's, but its complexity is part of its interest and its excitement. Um, so we, we designed a few things. So we didn't apply to dig within the scheduled area. We were trying to bring a large volunteer team there. And to be honest, the, the thought of uncovering complex Neolithic archaeology with a team of 30 volunteers and one or two professional archaeologists it intimidated me somewhat. Um, but the, uh, the actual area of the site, as far as we understood it, had only ever been defined by a technique called bozing in the 1920s, which is essentially dropping heavy weights on the ground, listening to see whether it echoed. There was an RCHME survey, earthwork survey, in the 1990s, uh, but again, that and, and limited geophysical survey, but, but still, the, the extent of the monument was still sort of like uh, poorly defined. So we did a geophysical survey, just a mag survey. It would benefit from a... Uh, uh, a radar survey as well, but we haven't got that. We'd, we surveyed the whole of the monument. We targeted areas outside the scheduled area to see whether or not they could be Neolithic features as well, because that could influence uh, the, the size of the scheduling. We undertook uh, an excavation. All of these things we, we did with volunteers. The excavation had about 70 volunteers on it. The geophysical training, about 10. Um, we also uh, took volunteers and we recatalogued and repackaged all the archive at Brighton Museum. Um, we attended numerous outreach events, not just our own, but you know, every outreach event that we could. We pop up museums and the museum uh, staff, that's Andy Maxted from the museum there, 
uh, bringing sort of pop-up museum displays and things. Um, how we got the information back to the volunteers again was uh, the volunteers would repackage and recatalogue the archive, our specialists would reassess the archive, and then our specialists would then hold seminars with those volunteers that had repackaged and recatalogued it to explain to them why all these things were so important. You can't involve uh, volunteers easily in specialist work, so that's how we did it. We had an open day, fantastic open day again, about six, seven hundred people attended. That's uh, Matt butchering a deer in the corner of the site with stone tools, being, uh, being observed by lots of people. We, removed, we got agreement from the race course to help fund the removal of uh, an illegal bund that had been placed over the monument in the 1980s to prevent traveller incursion again. Uh, we got joint funding for an interpretation on board with Brighton Hove City Council um, that we, we, we stuck on the site. And I think I've just about run out of time, so, um, so thank, thank you. you.